Good morning. Okay, first thing I wanted to talk to you about what's going on uh, with the building over there. We had, we did have the final inspection and there were some uh, corrections that need to, needed to be done. That's why we're not in there. And so uh, that's normal. That's the way that that goes. And so they'll be doing the uh, corrections over there and then we'll get them back, get back in. We're gonna get in there really soon. Um, the other thing that I wanted to tell you is uh, more personal. And so um, about a month and a half ago, my wife went into, Bobby went into um, the dermatologist and they found uh, melanoma under her toenail of all things. It's called a subungual melanoma. And um, we didn't know that's what it was. She'd had it for over a year. And uh, at first we just thought it was a stubbed toe and then we thought it was uh, fungus under her toe and that the fungus medicine wasn't working and when that didn't work she she went in and so that's a melanoma and so this last week uh, I took her over to Seattle and had a surgery and so they removed that and they also removed a couple of lymph nodes they're called sentinel lymph, lymph nodes and um, what's going to happen is they're going to do pathology on that so Basically, the reason I haven't told you anything is because I haven't had anything to tell you up until this point, but Bobby's missing now, and so <laughs> it's starting to get around. And so I wanna tell you what's going on. So this week, we're gonna find out uh, from pathology whether or not there is anything in the lymph nodes, and if there is, then we have to go on from there. Um, if there's not, then she's all done, and everything's good. And so that's, that's what I'm praying for, and so I would appreciate it if you were praying for her too. And so she, she's at home right now and she's, you know, she's sore from the surgeries and, and, uh, and that kind of stuff. So um, the doctor did tell me afterwards, you know, he's not telling me much of anything, but did tell me afterwards that there was nothing in the lymph nodes that looked like it was bad. So that's, that's a good thing to hear. So anyway, that's, that's what's going on with that. The other thing that happened is on the way home, uh, Israel got bombed. <laughs> And so um, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning uh, because it would be kind of, you know, we just need to talk about it. So um, I'm going to pause the book of Acts for this week. We'll get back into it next week. And I just wanted to talk to you about um, basically what's going on with the, with the nation of Israel, the Iranian uh, attack against them and the biblical implications of that. And so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 24 this morning, Matthew chapter 24. Why don't you turn there, grab your Bible. We're also going to be in the book of Revelation and the book of Ezekiel. So you can find all those. Matthew 24. And we're going to start reading in verse 1. Why don't you guys all stand and we'll go through and read it together. It says, And then Jesus went out uh, and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple, and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying I am the Christ and will deceive many and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And if you skip down to verse 36, it says, but of that day and hour, I'll wait till you get there. But of, the, of that, it should have just been one page. Just flip that page right over. <laughs> but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the son of man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, 
one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And let's pray. Father, thanks uh, again for your work in our lives. Thank you for uh, your word. Thank you that you wrote these things down thousands of years ago so that we would know what was going on in the times that we're living in. And Lord, as we, as we look at some of those prophecies and some of the fulfillments and, and uh, the precursors to the fulfillments that we're seeing taking place around us, we just pray that you'd give me understanding and help me to be clear. And Lord, that you would just build your people up here this morning. And we ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. Um, one, of, one of the things that you have in this passage is clear prophecies, obviously. Um, one of the clear prophecies that Jesus makes is that not one stone is going to be left upon another in the temple complex. That's literally what took place. When the temple was burnt down, uh, the temple itself was lined with gold on the inside. The gold melted, went between the cracks in the stones, and the Romans wanting to get all the gold dismantled the temple stone by stone and scraped it down so that when Jesus said that, the, that every stone, not one stone would be left standing on another, is absolutely true. You can go to Israel and you can see this. Jesus is a prophet, obviously. He's God in flesh, right? And so he prophesied about some other things in this passage. The disciples asked three questions. Jesus answers two of them in Matthew chapter 24, and it's the last two. Um, he, he does it in another passage, the, the first question in another passage in the book of Luke. But in Matthew 24, um, at the end of verse 3, he said, uh, they ask, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? I don't know that the apostles knew exactly what they were asking, but they asked the right questions, and Jesus lined Matthew 24 out after their questions. The first thing that he answers in Matthew 24 are what are going, going to be the signs before the second coming of Christ. Second coming of Christ means when Jesus comes back to the earth to set up his kingdom, he uh, comes down through the clouds, lands on the Mount of Olives, destroys the armies that are fighting against Israel. That's the second coming, okay? And so that's, that's written about in Revelation chapter 19 amongst other passages. And so that's what Jesus is answering in verses um, four all the way down through verse 30. Verse 31 is something that takes place after his second coming. Okay, and so when Jesus goes through and talks about events that are going to be taking place before the second coming, in verse 4 he says, number one, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And so in that passage, he is talking about false Christs. Are going to come on the scene okay um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute in verse 6 he says and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars see that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet and then the third thing he says is for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines pestilences and earthquakes in various places and so the third thing he talks about is famine, famines, and uh, the fourth thing that he talks about is pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Uh, he goes on and says these are the beginning of, the, of sorrows, and then the fifth thing he talks about is the persecution of believers. Okay? The reason I'm, I'm pointing that out is because that is exactly the outline of Revelation chapter 6. It starts off with a false messiah. It starts off with a false Christ, the Antichrist. Actually, the word fall, the, the, the phrase false Christ, the words false Christ, mean pseudo Christ. It, it's actually pseudo, -Christ, pseudo Christos in Greek. It means pseudo Christ, fake Christ, a fake Jesus comes on the scene, and that's exactly what the Antichrist is. He's a fake Jesus, a false messiah. And then it talks about warfare. And then it talks about famine, and then it talks about pestilences and death that take place. And then the fifth thing that it talks about in Revelation 6 is 
um, the persecution of believers. The sixth thing it talks about in Revelation 6 is the second coming of Christ in exactly the same words, same kind of words, that are used in verses 27 through 30. And so Revelation 6 is an overview of the tribulation period, just like Matthew 24 is an overview of the tribulation period, okay? When, when Jesus, again, is talking about his second coming, he talks about all these events that are gonna take place, and he puts them in the context of a period of time that he says is the worst time that the earth is ever going to experience, right? And that's the tribulation period. Then he stops the narrative and talks about two things. One thing is the return of the nation of Israel. And if you look at verses 32 through 35, I'm not going to go into it. That's the parable of the fig tree. You, you combine that with passages out of the Old Testament. It is clearly talking about the revival of the nation of Israel. And even if you don't agree with that, I don't care if you do because you're wrong. Just let me share that with you. Um, even if you don't agree with that, it is clearly taught in scripture that Israel, the nation Israel itself is a harbinger of the end times. That Israel is going to be back in the land gathered from all the nations of the world, not from Babylon, not from Assyria, from all the nations of the world, and it's going to be back in the land and it's never going to leave again. And so that's clearly taught in the Old Testament before the second coming of Christ, okay? Um, uh, and uh, obviously in, in the times that we're living in. And so he talks about na uh, the nation of Israel. And then if you look at verse 36, it's talk this section here is talking about the rapture of the church. And it says, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. Okay, so what does that say there? It says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. That's what it says, right? Okay, so can we stop it now? With the whole predicting the coming of Jesus for the church type of stuff. It just makes me crazy that people do this stuff. It's like the Bible clearly says you can't know the day or the hour, so stop predicting the day and the hour. Why, why would we do this? I don't get it. And so the eclipse just happened, right? And so I don't know, you know, I don't even pay attention when eclipses and stuff like that are going on and people start freaking out about them. It's like, I, I don't even pay attention to those things. And so I don't know what everybody was saying, but I got a bunch of memes from people saying, I went out and bought a hundred blow up people dolls and I'm gonna fill them up with helium so I can fake people into thinking that the rapture is happening <laughs> during the eclipse, right? And so I don't know if they were, if they were predicting that, I know that they were taught, you know, I got, I got one email that talked of, and you have to understand me, I got one email that talked about the eclipse and, you know, the eclipse going through all these towns called Nineveh, so I get out my maps and I start tracking where the eclipse is going. Did it go through all those towns? Nope. And then there, there was another section where it talked about you know, Salem and uh, the old eclipse going through Salem. Did it do that? Yeah, on, on some of them it did. On others, nope. There's, in, one, in one place, there wasn't even a town named Salem in the state that they said it was. And so I always check this stuff out. And so if they're lying at the beginning, I don't believe anything that they have to say. And then they tried to connect it with Hebrew letters and it's just silliness. You know how often we have eclipses of the sun? on the earth. Do you know how often? At least twice a year. Twice a year. It's not something that's, that's unheard of. And so the problem is that most of the planet is covered with water, and so most of the eclipses are over the Pacific Ocean, or you know, that kind of thing. And then we have other continents that nobody lives on, like Antarctica, and there's eclipses on Antarctica and, and stuff like that. So you just have to keep that in mind when you're looking at this stuff. And I'm not saying that God can't use an eclipse to make a statement, but he's going to make the statement before the eclipse. What I am saying is that when Jesus makes a statement about the end times, it's written in scripture. And you can look for that. There, there are things written in scripture that we need to be looking at. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. Okay. And so I think, like seriously, 
with this whole eclipse thing or, you know, Jesus is coming in September on whatever date in September and that kind of stuff. I think God has an angel up in heaven who's going through and cataloging every prediction that's made. God goes, I want you to catalog every prediction that's made and those are going to be the days I'm not coming back. <laughs> so people need to stop this. As soon as somebody makes a statement like that, I'm like, well, he's not coming back, back on that day. Thank you very much. And so just knock it off. Anyway, then he goes on and he says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And so in this instance, he's talking about something that is unexpected. It, by definition, cannot be what he was talking about in the previous 30 verses. This is unexpected. The other event has all this stuff that takes place before. So when I see all the wars and rumors of wars and the famines and the pestilences and the mountains knocked down and the persecution that takes place and the abomination of desolation and all of the stuff that goes on, the, the, the sun ceasing to shine and the moon not giving her light, the moon turning blood red while the, sun, while the sun is darkened and stars falling from the heavens. When I see all that stuff, then I know that Jesus is coming back the second time. So here we're talking about something else because this is unexpected. And so before the flood, the flood was an event that was unexpected by everyone except for who? Noah. And what was Noah? He's a believer. Noah's a believer. And God told the believer what he was going to do with the flood. And so the only thing that the world could look at regarding the flood was the fact that there was a believer who kept saying that the Lord is going to judge this planet and an ark. Them watching him, him build an ark. And that's all the information that they had and they didn't believe it. And so they carried on with their life. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, okay, before the flood came and took them all away. Jesus said it's going to be exactly the same when he comes back for you and for me. And that's what this is talking about here. Business as usual, okay. I'm going to go through and just give you a description of what the Bible says about the, the, the great, tribula great Tribulation. A time that has been like any other time on the planet Earth. The Bible says this multiple times and it comes out of the mouth of Jesus, Okay. So you are not in the tribulation because we're not living in times like nothing that the earth has ever seen to the point where all flesh could die. We're, we're not living in those times right now. So you're not in the tribulation and I don't care what anybody says to you. This is what the Bible says. The Bible talks about a quarter of the earth being killed from the get-go. Two billion people at this point, dead from the get-go. Then another third, that's half the planet if you know your fractions. Half the planet is dead in two battles, basically. You have, um, you have the destruction of the oceans. By the time you get to the end of the tribulation period, the Bible says the oceans are dead. There's no life in the oceans. The Bible talks about tsunamis, talks about the de destruction of ships uh, out on the ocean. That's tsunamis, basically. The Bible talks about all the, uh, all the green grass burned up. It talks about a third of all the trees on the planet, planet-wide being burned up. It talks about the sun burning the earth. You talk about global warming. You have not seen global warming yet. It's coming. And so, you know, it, it talks about uh, multiple, it looks like nuclear attacks on the planet. It looks like, it like, looks like a city is destroyed by a nuclear weapon in Revelation chapter 17. Um, you know, and I could just go on and on with all, all kinds of stuff. It's one plague after another plague after another plague. And by the time you get to the end of the tribulation, you have people riding around on horseback because all the infrastructure is gone. The cities are knocked down. The mountains are knocked down. There are no islands, is how the Bible describes this. And so you have, you have rampant destruction on the planet. And if that's the case, would you be planning your wedding? It says they're eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage before the flood came. So you wouldn't be planning your, you're not going to have a barbecue. 
hey, come on over for a barbecue. Realize, you know, everything's destroyed, but might as well have a barbecue. What do you think? You know, people aren't going to be doing that. People are going to be running, hiding in caves. That's how it's described in, uh, in the book of Revelation. And so um, you don't have that in this situation that Jesus is talking about. What you have in this situation is something that is along the lines of what we see right now, where people are living their lives. Even though there's kind of rowdy things going on, people are living their lives and people are still planning weddings, right? I know this because I'm a pastor, right? It goes on and says, again, they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. See that word took them there? It means to take away, to remove, to destroy, to kill. That's what that word means in Greek. Took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then, Jesus goes on and says, then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Okay? And so he gives this illustration of two men being in the field. So when he's talking about the guys in the flood, they were killed, they were destroyed. When you get to verse 40, Jesus changes the verb. And he says, then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. And that word taken means to take to one side, to admit, to receive to oneself, oneself as a possession or for instruction to be carried off. That's not a word that means destroyed. That means a, that's a word that means to be carried away. And so the event that Jesus is talking about is a situation where two guys are working in the field, working in construction or working as a farmer, whatever. Two guys are there, one's taken, the other one's left. Two women are grinding at a mill, obviously they're inside some place and one is taken and the other's left. And that's the description, and that's a description of what the Bible calls the rapture. Actually, what we call the rapture, what the Bible calls the harpazo. In Latin, it becomes rapir, which is where we get our word rapture from. And it is the resurrection of the dead and the taking of those living believers who are still on the earth at the time that church, Jesus comes back for the church. And so he talks about that. Um, he goes on and he says, verse 43, know, that, uh, know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. I like that illustration too. You ever had a thief call you up and say, hey, going to rip you off about 3 o'clock in the morning. Can you go stack your TV and, um, you know, all your electronics and uh, any guns or, or anything other, uh, any other stuff of value, go stack it by the front door because I don't want to wake up your family. Did a thief ever announce to you that he was coming to rip you off? Obviously not, and I'm being facetious about that. And so if you want to catch a thief, you're going to have to watch. You're going to have to be ready. And that's the point that Jesus is making there. I'm coming like a thief. He goes on, gives some warnings, and when you get to chapter 25, he gives the parable of the ten virgin, virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish, five were ready, five were not. And when the wedding feast takes place, the five who are ready go with the bridegroom. And you know that the church is called the bride of Christ. Who's the bridegroom? Christ himself. And they go with the bridegroom. And when the five foolish um, women come to the door, he says, depart from me, I never knew you. And then he ends it with this, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And so another illustration that you're, gonna, you're not going to just know by events that are taking place around you. It's a situation where you have to be ready at all times because it could happen at any moment. Maybe now. <laughs> I'm just goofing around, but wouldn't it be cool if all of a sudden, ding, we're out of here. <laughs> that would be really cool. And that's the, that's the kind of waiting that we need to have. Turn over to Luke 17. Luke 17. This is another place where Jesus uses some of the same illustrations and specifically the same language about taking believers out of here 
in a completely different context. He's talking about him coming for the believers, but it's not what's called the Olivet Discourse. It's not the same sermon that he just gave there. He's talking in an, uh, at another place where he's answering questions, and he tells you the same thing, gives you some more detail. It goes on in verse 26, in, verse, uh, in chapter 17, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built, but on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Okay, so he gives another illustration. He uses the same illustration with Noah. And with Noah, instead of the word taken, he says he destroyed them all. That word for, um, uh, it goes on in this passage and, and says, uh, down in verse 34, I tell you in that night there will be two men in one bed. It literally says two in one bed. The one will be taken and the other left. That remains that word that means to be brought alongside somebody, to be taken away. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Uh, two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. Okay, and so he, now he's using the illustration of Lot. So what happened with Lot? And the only one that uh, was in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that knew that Sodom and Gomorrah were gonna be destroyed was Lot and actually Abraham from the day before. Abraham was told the day before. And so Lot knows about it because the angels came to get him out and said, we need to get out of here. We're about to destroy the city. And the only ones who left with Lot were Lot and the members of his family who didn't think he was nuts. The rest of them stayed in Sodom and Gomorrah and got killed in the destruction that came down on Sodom and Gomorrah. And even when his family left, his wife looked back and Jesus gives a warning in this passage about don't be looking back. Don't have your heart set on the things of the world. You need to be ready for my return for you. And that, that is the, the teaching there. And so again, they're eating, they're drinking, um, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built business as usual. So nobody's building a house at the end of the tribulation period. Nobody's out buying and selling at the end of the tribulation period. They're just waiting for judgment and hiding in caves and in dens of the earth, the Bible says. And so again, you, you have that situation. Okay, so now turn over to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. When you're, when you're looking again at the beginning of the tribulation period, it starts out with a bang, so to speak, and there is warfare. When you look at the tribulation period as a whole, there's a, there's a purpose for it. And so in Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 7 through 10, it says this, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, Jacob is, a, is the original name of Israel. Jacob had his name changed to Israel, and his name represents the nation of Israel. And so the tribulation period that's spoken about in Revelation is called the time of Jacob's trouble. It says, he shall be saved out of it, for it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Therefore, do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, and be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid. So the major reason that God does the tribulation period is because he wants the Jews. He wants them to come back into a relationship with them. There are lots of religious Jews over in Israel right now. There's lots of religious Jews throughout the world, but they're not followers of the Lord anymore because they're not doing the things that God wants them to do. And so God has sent his Messiah. They have rejected him. And what God is doing during the tribulation period is showing his people who the Messiah is and that it's actually Jesus. And by the end of the tribulation, they were, they're going to know this. And so Jacob is going to be turned back to the Lord 
by the tribulation period. There's other people that are going to get saved too, but that's the main purpose of the tribulation period as far as Israel is concerned, which means you've got to have an Israel. They have to be in the land because that's where this has taken place. Daniel 12, 1 and 2 says this, And at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. That's Israel again. He's talking to Daniel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who's found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so in that passage, we find out that this period of time is worse than any nation has ever seen in all of history. That's, that's how the Bible describes the tribulation period. Jesus described it this way, Matthew 24, 21 through 22. He says, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world. That includes the flood. That includes Sodom and Gomorrah. It includes every destruction of every nation that you've ever seen in all of history. It's worse than any of that is what Jesus said. Until this time, no nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Jesus is literally saying there, if he didn't come back in time, there would be no life on this planet. So that's how bad the tribulation is. So when you get people telling you that you're in the midst of the tribulation, well, I haven't seen anything that's that bad. When you get people who said the tribulation's already passed, happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, you didn't even know what happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago before you were a Christian. You had no clue. Nobody did. Because it's not this major point in, in history. We don't even teach it in our schools. And so it's not the worst thing that's ever happened, but it is coming. And that's the tribulation period. Um, in Amos 5.18 through 20, the tribulation period is called the day of the Lord. And that is something that is throughout scripture. When you, when you start talking about the day of the Lord, one of the major events that takes place is this seven year period where God is judging the earth. And again, called the day of the Lord. Amos describes it this way. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? And that description is, the guy's being chased by a lion, and a bear meets him. He gets away from the bear, get, finally gets into his house, leans his hand up against the wall, and a serpent bites him. He's having a bad day. Day of the Lord is a bad day, like a really, 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 really bad day. And that's the point that Amos is making. And that's what's described in the book of Revelation. That's what's described in Matthew 24 by Jesus. And that's the, those are the events that take place after the church is taken out. Okay, so in chapter 6, it says, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, With a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Lots of people, you can pick up commentaries that will say that that's Jesus. Here's the problem. When Jesus comes back in Revelation chapter 19, he's not carrying a bow. He's got a sword at his side, but he's not even using the sword at his side. He's using the sword that comes out of his mouth. He's literally destroying people with the word that comes out of his mouth destroying armies, conquering the world with the word that comes out of his mouth. He doesn't need a sword, doesn't need a bow. Um, this guy's riding on a white horse. Jesus rides on a white horse. It's a good copy of Jesus, and that's exactly the point. The Antichrist is a fake Jesus, as I already, uh, as I already stated. And so he comes on the scene doing that. When you look at the second seal, it says, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see, and another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Not a small sword, a great one, because there's going to be a great slaughter in this warfare. And so the second seal is talking about warfare. That lets you know, because the Antichrist goes out conquering and to conquer, 
and there's warfare connected with it, that the Antichrist is rising through warfare. That's how he comes on the scene. Then the third seal is famine. He says, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. Oil in the wine part is letting you know that there's still going to be rich people. Um, when you're talking about a quart of wheat for a denarius, a quart of wheat is the amount of wheat you need to make a loaf of bread. It's not the amount of flour. It's the amount of wheat. You're not even getting flour for a denarius. You're getting the, the, the ingredients to make flour, which turns into, you know, you make it into bread with water and yeast and all of that kind of stuff. So you can get the ingredients for a loaf of bread for a denarius, and a denarius is a day's wage. Now in California, a day's wage is 160 bucks, 20, 20 bucks an hour, right? And so that's a day's wage uh, down in California, 160 bucks, not for a loaf of bread, for the ingredients to make a loaf of bread. And then it, it goes on and says three quarts of barley for a denarius. And so if you want to get a cheaper grain, you can get three loaves out of that. And that's talking about famine. And famine generally follows warfare. Because when you have a war, you have armies going through a country, and you can't plant, and you can't harvest, and you, you, you can't plow. And so they lose a year of food. And so people starve to death because of that. So famine follows warfare, and that's just normal for all warfare, but the warfare we're talking about is something that's abnormal, and you get that in the next passage. In verse 7, the fourth seal, it says, When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse. That's literally a pale green horse, like sickly green. It's kind of something you'd see in a horror movie and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades or hell followed with him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword with hunger with death and by the beasts of the earth okay and so that is the destruction the death that comes from this warfare that takes place this warfare is rel relatively short because when the Antichrist comes on the scene, other passages talk about the fact that he brings peace to the earth. And that implies that there was warfare going on and the Antichrist stops it. So he brings peace to the earth and that's the first three and a half years of the tribulation period and then he violates that, that covenant. In any case, a fourth of the earth, that's one quarter of the earth's population is killed at the beginning of the tribulation period, one fourth. We've got about eight, people, 8 billion people on this planet right now. That's 2 billion people. The, the United States only has 350 million people in it right now. And so that's almost seven times the population of the United States that gets, gets killed at the get-go of the tribulation period. And then later on, there's another battle that takes place, another third, and if you know your fractions, that's half the planet is killed in two battles in the book of Revelation. And that's not talking about any of the other judgments that come down on the earth. That's just two battles that take place. Well, what kind of battle could kill off a quarter of the earth's population? And again, we know what it is. It's gonna be nuclear, biological, or chemical. It's gonna be one of those three. And in the Bible, it looks like it's nuclear. Um, one of the things that happens after a nuclear war is the, when, you, when you fire off a nuclear weapon, it's hotter than the sun. This is, we're talking about thermal nuclear weapons. They are hotter than the sun, and they suck up the dirt that's underneath them. This is where you get a mushroom cloud from. It sucks up the dirt that's underneath it and all the debris, and it irradiates it, and then it throws it up into the upper atmosphere, and as the wind blows through, it falls out. That's where you get the term fallout, and it's coming down, and it's radioactive. And that dust comes down and rests on the earth. If you get it on you and you don't wash it off immediately, you die. If you breathe it, 
you die. When it hits the earth, it sterilizes the earth itself. It sterilizes the soil, and you can't plant anything in that soil. You have to scrape it off and get down below it to be able to plant anything, and you have famine, and you die. And that's the picture that you, that you have in these passages as we go through and look at them. It's the only way you can kill off a quarter of this planet, and we're living in the only times that this could actually happen. You couldn't kill off a quarter of the Earth's, uh, Earth's population in any kind of warfare before the mid-20th century. You could go through with guns and just go around the planet and keep going around, and you're not going to kill off a quarter of the, of the population because they're going to repopulate the Earth before you can get back around to them. This is the only way that you can do this. And so another one of those instances where you got a 2,000-year-old book that's predicting things that can happen in our times. Okay, turn over to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 38. It goes the um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel in chapter 38. And we have what I believe is that battle that's being talked about in Revelation chapter 6. And this is where all these events that you're looking at right now that are in the news come into play. In verse 1 of chapter 38. Actually, let me, let me give you a, uh, some previews here. Remember I told you that Israel is a harbinger of the last days? In chapter 37, it is talking about Israel being brought together, back together as a nation in the last days, and that they're never going to leave the land of Israel again. And that when they come back together as one nation, as a nation, it's going to be one nation, not two nations. If you know your ancient Israeli history, you know they divided up into two nations. It's going to be one nation, and um, they're going to be back in the land. When that happens, you have this battle in chapter 38 and 39 that's going to take place after they're back in the land. Let's read about it. In verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all its troops, the house of Tagarma from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely, or literally securely. I want to read you something. This is um, from uh, uh, the White House. If I can get this. Oh, here we go. It's from the White House, and it's talking about the attack that took place last night. Um, there, was a, there were 170 drones, 120 ballistic missiles and at least 30 cruise missiles and there were more than that actually that that came into israel and most of them were shot down they came from various places most of them came from iran uh, what's interesting is the jordanians helped shoot some of these things down that is biblically uh, interesting too because the bible predicts that jordan is going to be at least conversant if not an ally of israel in the last days and so, again, you, you have that. And one of the things that's, that's taken place right now is you've got a bunch of diplomats who are deciding that uh, what Israel's response to over 130 missiles coming into their country should be. And um, our, our uh, White House is one of those respondents. This is what um, uh, uh, Mr. Biden said. He said, I've just spoken with Prime Minister Netanyahu to reaffirm America's ironclad commitment to the security of Israel. I told him that Israel demonstrated a remarkable capacity to defend against and defeat even unprecedented attacks, sending a clear message to its foes that they cannot effectively threaten the security of Israel. 
In this passage, it says that these people are all going to dwell safely. That's literally secure. They have a security there. And that's a language that he's using. By the way, he also stated that if Israel um, had an offensive attack against Iran, we're not going to back them up. That's just par for the course. It's one of the reasons we're in the situation we're in right now. Um, Israel has been uh, basically at war with Iran for a good, uh, at least three decades at this point. But Iran's doing it through proxies. And so they have Hezbollah or Hamas firing rockets into Israel when it's Iran that has paid for the rockets, even built the rockets and shipped the rockets uh, to these terrorist organizations and is funding the terrorist organizations themselves. And so you have that going on. And what uh, Israel has been doing is firing back at Hamas and Hezbollah. Have, have you guys ever fought with a bully? Anybody ever get in a fight with a bully? Raise your hands. Okay. When you fight with a bully, um, you know, do you have to kill the bully? No. Can you talk to the bully and make them stop? No. What you have to do with the bully is you have to make them afraid of you. Would you agree with this? I don't get politicians. I don't, I don't get diplomats. Because Iran is obviously not afraid. They have warned the United States that if the United States gets involved with protecting Israel, they say defending Israel or attacking Iran, that Iran will attack U.S. bases. And, you know, for the last 30 years, I've thought that every time a rocket goes into Israel, Israel just should just fire five off at Iran and, you know, take care of it that way. That would take care of it. They would stop it at that point. But we don't, and it just keeps going on. And so you have that kind of thing. Another thing, I was just listening to the news this morning before I came on for service, and one of the um, news commentators is talking about the issues that are going on with Iran and Israel and, and that kind of stuff. And he said, we're hearing about all these wars and rumors. Actually, we're hearing about all these rumors of wars. And I'm like, dude, you're speaking out of the, do you know where that comes from? It comes right out of the mouth of Jesus. And so, again, you have this. He's, he goes on and he says, you will ascend coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Okay. When you go through this passage, it's identifying the nations that are going to come back, come out against Israel after they're back in the land, and it doesn't use geography. What it uses is people groups. So you want to put that slide up there? And so this is, this is talking about the people groups that are up there. See this, this group of people right here? They're called the Scythians. And when you go back in ancient history and you look at the, the historians from the time of Ezekiel all the way up into the time of Christ, the Scythians are Rosh and Meshach and Tubal and all of these guys. These are, called, these are, are who they identify as Scythian tribes. The Scythians ruled from Ukraine, which is over here, all the way over to southern Siberia, which is over here. This, you guys, is Russia. That's Russia. And so that is the leader of this group of nations. It goes on, and when you look down in verse 5, Persia, there's, there's Persia right here. So Persia is sitting, let's see, right in this area right here. This is Persia. You know what that's today? That's Iran. Iran was called Persia until the 20th century. And then, we, then they renamed it for whatever reason. And when, go to the next slide. This is talking about this attack in the book of Ezekiel. This is Togarma right here. You know what this is nowadays? That's Turkey. That's Turkey. This is Ethiopia. That's Libya. These are the nations that are listed here. And all of these nations are aligned now. When you're talking about Libya, just read an article just yesterday about Libya. Russia is in control of the eastern half of Libya. They're looking at getting control of the western half of Libya also. They've got allies in there, but they're in control of it. They're going to put bases in Libya. They're making inroads into Ethiopia right at this point. At this point. And both of those nations are, are mainly Muslim nations. They, by default, do not like Israel. Okay? Turkey has, within the last 20 years, become an ally of both Russia. Turkey is supposed to be a NATO ally. They've become a, uh, uh, an ally of both Russia 
and Iran, and they're making military alliances with each other. This, this is, this is, you know, when I got saved, it was 1975. In 75, Iran was, um, was an American ally. Turkey was an American and Israeli ally at that time. Iran was also an Israeli ally at the time that I got saved. And so it's been from the time that I was in high school to the times that we're living in right now that it's all changed and become a situation where all these nations are aligned. Here's the other thing. When these nations come down, they come down for a spoil. You can read that in the rest of the passage there. When I was a kid, there was no spoil in Israel. There was nothing that you would come down there for. And it wasn't until about 20 years ago that they found oil, or they, uh, excuse me, they found gas off the coast of Israel, huge gas deposits. And what they want to do with those is they want to sell them to Europe. You know what's, what the United States wants to do with Europe? They want to keep the Russians from selling gas to Europe. That's why that, that pipeline got blown up a couple of years ago. We want to keep the Russians from selling gas to Europe because it's making the Russians rich. The Russians have a reason to try to keep the Israelis from uh, taking their market in Europe. And so that's a spoil, you guys. They can come down and they can secure their national wealth by taking out the nation of Israel and even taking their, their gas. Turkey wants Israeli gas. They're fighting with Israel over the fact that they should have uh, a share of that gas even though it's not off their coastline. And they're trying to take it from Israel. And so you even have the spoil lined up within the last 20 years and actually less than that. In any case, when these nations come down, they, co they don't make a plan to come down. What the Bible says is that they're drawn into the warfare. And so you can see that in verse 4. God says, I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with, your, with all your army. If you look over at uh, verse 2 of chapter 39, I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And if you're paying attention to the news, What's happening right now is, you, if, is you've got all, all these politicians who are saying, we don't want to be drawn into a Middle East conflict. And that is exactly what's going to take place. These nations are going to be drawn into the Middle East conflict, and that's where they're going to be destroyed. And so at the, in the rest of chapter 38, it talks about these nations coming down against Israel and they are destroyed on the mountains of Israel by fire and by brimstone, by flooding rain and hailstones and earthquakes, okay? And so that could be a natural judgment. Well, it's supernatural, supernatural judgment from God. Or did you know that when you fire off a nuclear weapon, it makes its own weather? When they fired off the atomic bomb, that's just an atomic bomb. When they fired off the atomic bomb, dropped the atomic bomb over Hiroshima, it made it rain. There were raindrops that came down as big as marbles. Hailstones fell down because that's what happens. You're, you're, you're taking vapor out of the atmosphere, literally makes its own weather. You think that when they drop a nuclear weapon, the earth might shake? Yeah. And so you got all, all of that stuff that, that's going on. And their armies are destroyed on the mountains of Israel. Not only their armies, if you look over at chapter 39, it says, I'll turn you around, lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Verse 3, then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. Let me s stop right there and talk about this. Earlier it talked about horses, horsemen, uh, talks about people handling swords and shields, that kind of stuff. And you don't need to be put off by that. Horses, you know what horses are in Hebrew? Leapers. That's literally the word in Hebrew, leapers. And so this was first translated into English, basically. I'm doing basic stuff. King James was translated into English in the 1600s when you had an army that was riding on a leaper in Hebrew. That would be a cavalry. You're talking about horses there but we're talking about 21st century at least. So when you've got an army that's being transported into a place where they're going to go into battle, where are they being transported in? That could be called a leaper. That could be helicopters, 
That could, that could be um, flights of soldiers being dropped in. It could be paratroops. It could be all kinds of stuff. And when you talk about the word for sword, the word for sword is literally, in Hebrew, weapon for laying waste. In 1600, weapons for laying waste were swords. In the 20th century, the 21st century, weapons for laying waste could be any number of weapons. It could, it could be um, actual assault rifles, the real ones. Um, it, could, it, it, it could be RPGs. It could be a number of things, weapons for laying waste. When you're talking about bows, the word for bow literally in Hebrew is launcher. The word for um, arrow is piercer. And it literally it comes from a term that means thunderbolt. It means piercer that comes down like a thunderbolt. And that would be a good description of a missile, wouldn't it? And so, uh, again, you don't need to be put off by the translation because the word says leapers, le weapons for laying waste, piercers, launchers, thunderbolts, and so on. That's what it says in Hebrew. And so that's what's going to be taking place. I'll knock the bow out of your left hand, cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, for, verse 4, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open field, for I have spoken, says the Lord, and I will send fire on Magog, that's the homeland, and on those who live in security in the coastlands, then they shall know that I am the Lord. That's a repetition of something that he'd, he's, he's already said in the passage here. And so the, the homelands of these nations are going to be destroy, destroyed by fire and brimstone, flooding rain and hailstones. Same judgment is coming down on these homelands of these people. And when it says the coastlands, that is a group of people that is, uh, or actually it is, Bible speak for Gentiles, people who live in the coastlands. You can go through the rest of the Bible and you can find it referencing all these different nations that live um, far away from the land of Israel. I don't know that it includes the United States, but there's not a reason that it can't include the United States. It for sure includes nations all around the Mediterranean Sea. For sure it includes those. And so, again, if that's nuclear, and it looks like it is, because afterwards, when they do the burials of these bodies that are left over, they don't touch the bones. They mark them. People specially trained to take the bones, take them, and bury them downwind across the Dead Sea from the land of Israel. That sounds like what you do with NBC cleanup, nu nuclear, biological, and chemical cleanup. And so, ag again, you have that. This is what we're looking at. This is, this is what uh, it looks like starts off the tribulation period. It's this battle that the Antichrist rises out of and consolidates power and brings peace to the earth um, afterwards. In fact, one of the things that the Antichrist does is he makes a, a covenant with the people of Israel for seven, day, seven years that they can, keep, they can have their temple. He rebuilds the temple for them. And this is basically a Muslim attack against Israel. And one of the things that the Muslims don't want is for Israel to rebuild their temple. They don't want Israel in the land of Israel. And so what you have here is Muslims starting World War III. What you would have after this event is the rest of the world going to the Muslims, shut your face. And the Antichrist allows them to rebuild their temple at that point. And the point I'm making is there has to be an impetus to the things that you see in the last days, whether you're talking about a cashless society or Israel allowed to rebuild their temple or uh, a worldwide government or a worldwide religion. Religion started this war or a worldwide religion. All of those things are gonna be coming out of this. And so, while um, I don't believe that we're necessarily going to be here to see all of this, when I'm looking around at the world and I see all these nations lining up and I see specifically Iran crossing the line that they just crossed, 
where they're openly at war with the nation of Israel, when I see that, I'm starting to pay attention because I know that what can come from this is that Russia and all these other nations can literally be drawn into it and bam, we're in Re Revelation chapter 38 and we are, we're starting that series of events that goes straight in to the tribulation period and we know that Jesus is coming before that. So, are you looking up? Are you paying attention? Are you ready? Is your heart right before the Lord? Are the, are the hearts of the people that you know right before the Lord? You know, it's like, it's like uh, every time that I talk about this stuff, actually in the last, specifically in the last 20 years, every time that I've talked about it, I've been like, I don't understand how we're still here. And what I see the Lord doing is basically putting things off. It's, it's happening incrementally, but he's putting things off as long as possible because he's not willing that any should perish. And he wants all to come to repentance. And so um, the world is not teaching this. The world is not preaching this. This is what the Bible says about the times that we're living in. So we need to be aware of these things. You have supernatural knowledge. You have supernatural insight into politics and geopolitics and all of the things that you're seeing on the, on, in the news. And you have a supernatural insight into events that are going to be taking place in the lives of the people who are going to be left behind. And they need to know it. We need to be telling people. Last verse I'm going to give you is... Um, I always do this in Luke 21, in verse 34, Jesus has just got done talking about these times that I've just talked about. And he says this in verse 34 of chapter 21, take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. Drowsing, or, uh, carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life can keep you from going. It can turn your heart away from the Lord, right? That's the point that he's making. He says, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And so it's not just escape, it's escape and stand before the Son of Man. That's what I want to do. I want to get out of here. I want to be standing before Jesus. That's, that's the ideal place to be. By the way, I'm not scared of the tribulation. I know if, uh, that if Jesus wanted me to go through the tribulation, it, you know, I'd just go through it. That's the way that it would go. I'm not scared of nuclear war. If they shot nukes at our city, I'd go catch one. You know? you know what I mean? I'm not prepared to bury myself in the ground for two weeks under 15 feet of soil. That's how you'd have to, you, you could last. You could, you could outlast a nuclear war if you buried your, yourself in the ground for two weeks under 15 feet of soil. But I don't have that going on right now. And so if they blew up a nuke around here, there'd be fallout and I'd die miserably. So go catch the thing, basically, right? And I like end of the world movies. I love them. Mad Max. <laughs> you, know, it's like, I, you know, I could just see myself at the end of the world and guys in weird trucks coming up, weird hairdos. In fact, I've got a hairdo that's just ideal for end of the world stuff, right? And so I'm not afraid of that stuff. I don't believe in the rapture because I'm afraid of going through the tribulation. I believe in the rapture because I am convinced that that is exactly what the Bible says. And so you need to be ready for it. You need to be ready for it. So are you ready? Have you given your life to Jesus? Are you walking with him? You're messing around with the world. Watch therefore, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. All right, I'm done. Let's, let's all stand. Let's pray for you. Father, thank you again for the time together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that um, you, you've said in your word that you don't do anything unless you reveal it to your servants, the prophets. And so as we've been going through the Bible, we have uh, specific biblical prophecy that you say is going to be taking place in the last days. And Lord, we can look at it. And then we can look at our newspapers and look at what's going on on the internet. We can see these things about to be um, come reality. 
And so, Father, we know that, the, that it's getting close to the time that you're going to be sending your son uh, to take us home to be with you. And, Lord, we thank you for that. I just pray for your people here that each one of us would be ready, that we'd have hearts that are right before you, um, that we'd be prayed up and be, be paying attention to our walks with you. And I just ask that you it would encourage us in our walks with you as we go through this week. Just bless your people. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. One more thing. I have had, I, I've heard numerous Bible studies on this, and there have been times when I heard a Bible study like this, and I was scared spitless at what I heard. And the reason I was, was because I was messing around with the world. And if you're scared, then that's, that's probably the reason. And so you need to knock it off, get your heart right with the Lord, and just be walking with him. You don't want to be embarrassed when Jesus comes back, right? All right, it's that easy. Okay.